welcome this is going to be our first session so in this we'll be doing introduction to optimization uh, we'll follow this up with uh, linear and non linear regression right so in this we'll be basically doing that given a set of data points and a model how do we find out the model coefficients right then we'll be discussing this uh, five meta heuristic techniques teaching learning based optimization particle swarm optimization differential evolution genetic algorithm and artificial b colony optimization right so in genetic algorithm we will be discussing both binary and real coded ga so we will not only be discussing this meta heuristic techniques we will also implement them in matlab right so we will be using matlab uh, once you understand the techniques you are free to implement it on whichever programming language you are comfortable with so the assignments and quiz will not uh, involve any coding uh, exercise right so it is not necessary for you to know matlab or learn matlab uh to be able to do the assignments or uh give the exam but we will be doing um considerable portion of this course in matlab right and we'll also introduce you to couple of other softwares which we'll look into right so we'll also be looking at constraint handling so initially when we discuss this problems we'll be uh, initially when we discuss this uh meta heuristic techniques we'll be looking at only at unconstrained problems unconstrained and 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 bounded problems right so uh, we'll assume that there are no constraints and then we'll discuss these uh, techniques then we'll let you uh, then uh, we'll discuss how do we handle constraints in in such in this meta heuristic techniques if the problem has constraints how do we uh, handle the handle the constraints using this meta heuristic techniques so broadly we'll be looking into penalty based and correction approaches right so once you know penalty based constraint handling or correction approach for constraint handling you can use that with all of this five techniques uh, to solve any constraint optimization problem right we'll also be looking at uh, two mathematical programming techniques linear programming and mixed integer linear programming right so we are also bringing this mathematical programming techniques uh, into this so that you can actually uh also understand the limitations of meta heuristic techniques right so given an optimization problem there are multiple ways to solve it right so we should be in a position to select the best possible uh, set of techniques that can help us to solve the problem then we'll be looking at a production planning case study right so in this we'll take one problem and we'll model it as a milp right we'll model and solve it as an milp also we'll model and solve it using meta heuristic techniques so the reason for doing this is you will be able to understand the strength and weakness of both mathematical programming techniques and meta heuristic techniques right so we'll take a problem which you can consider it to be a real life optimization problem and then we show uh, how do we solve it with both mathematical programming as well as meta heuristic techniques so that you can understand the strength and weakness of both of them as part of this course we'll be introducing you to three different uh, state of the optimization solvers right one is um, optimization toolbox of matlab uh, we'll be looking at ibm ilog uh, simplex optimization studio we'll be looking at gender, general algebraic modeling system gams right and we'll also look at uh, neos optimization solver right so both of this we'll be using together right so optimization toolbox of matlab it has inbuilt mathematical programming techniques for linear programming non linear programming and mixed integer linear programming it has inbuilt meta heuristic techniques which can solve non linear programming for which mathematical programming techniques are also available and it can solve certain versions of mixed integer non linear programming also we'll be using matlab right for implementing the meta heuristic techniques that we'll discuss Uh, IBM iLog Simplex optimization the full version is available as part of IBM Academic Initiative right so non academic users can use either the demo or evaluation version right so IBM iLog Simplex optimization studio can be used for solving linear programming mixed integer linear programming quadratic programming and mixed integer quadratic programming mixed integer quadratic constraint program constraint programming as well as constraint programming right so you can go to this link and uh, you will have to register right and then you will be able to freely download uh, that software okay so gams is primarily a modeling language right so wherein you merely state what is the problem right 
and then there are a set of solvers which can be used to solve it right. So, the solvers which come with the free uh, with the uh, demo version of GAMS uh, is limited right like it cannot solve problems of very large dimension. So, what we will do is uh, we will code the problem in GAMS right and then we have this new solver which can accept the GAMS files uh, right and then it can solve the problem for us. Once the problem is solved we will be getting the results uh, we can get the results over email or it will even be displayed on your browser wherein you submit the prob when you submit the problem right. So, GAMS can be used for linear programming, mixed integer linear programming, non-linear programming and mixed integer non-linear programming right uh, and this NEOS optimization solver we will be using it only for GAMS but if you go and have a look at uh, this website neosserver.org you will see that it accepts input from a wide range of modeling platforms not only from GAMS right. So, the reason for uh, taking three different solvers and not restricting to one solver is each of the solver has their own limitation right. So, for example, optimization toolbox of MATLAB cannot solve uh, mixed integer nonlinear programming when equality constraints are involved right. So, when equality constraints are involved it does not support integer variables there is no function uh, as of now that is in 2019 which can solve a uh, proper MINLP problem. The good thing about uh, MATLAB is uh, programming is much easier in MATLAB right. So, that is why we are going to use it to code the meta heuristic techniques in MATLAB. Uh, this IBM ILOG uh, Simplex Optimization Studio again cannot solve MINLP problems right, uh, a generic MINLP problem it cannot solve. Uh, but the good thing about this particular software is its full version is available as part of IBM academic initiative plus this constraint programming is available which is not there in MATLAB right. Similarly, the good thing about GAMS is no matter what is the problem size we will be able to uh, use it to model it and we can solve it using the freely available NEOS optimization solver. So, this can solve MINLP also right. The drawback of GAMS is that the demo version does not solve bigger larger problems. So, we will overcome that limitation with this uh, NEOS optimization solver right. So, each of the software has their own uh, set of benefits and drawbacks right. So, we are looking into uh, the best possible set of tools so that we can solve most of the optimization problems uh, that are encountered in real life. In this session we will be looking into uh, what are the components of an optimization problem uh, and also how do we classify optimization problems and also into how we classify optimization techniques. Some of the common applications of uh, optimization are time tabling right. So, for example, uh, our time tabling uh, wherein we need to schedule uh, the classes right, we need to decide which course would be taught in uh, which class at what time. Right. So, that is a classical apl application of time tabling. Another common application is site selection right. So, if you want to establish an industry you, you have lot of options right to establish the industry. So, you need to decide where you want to establish the industry. So, depending upon the industry a large number of factors will uh, play a role into how we decide uh, the optimal location of an industry. Optimization is also widely used in production planning, controlling and scheduling. It is used in tariff design and these are some uh, engineering applications of optimization. Uh, you can also look into uh, various other applications right. So, if you go to this website this is a GAMS website right. So, this is one of the software that we will be learning as part of this course right. So, it has a collection of problems right depending upon the subject you can look into the problems depending upon the subject. So, right here if we see it has been used in macroeconomics, management science and OR, finance, uh, stochastic programming, microeconomics, chemical engineering right. So, this is just a, a very small subset of uh, problems which we are showing over here right. So, if you go into this go, if you go to this website you will be able to see a large collection of problems and you will be able to see that it is used in uh, various uh, areas right. So, all these files are freely available. So, you can even sort them as per the uh, type of problem right and this briefly describes what is the problem. So, 
these are some commercial success story reported by MathWorks. So, MathWorks is the company which owns MATLAB, right. So, here we have shown uh, four uh, commercial applications. If you are interested, you can go and have a look at uh, the individual story and see how uh, it has been applied uh, in that particular industry. These are some of the applications from uh, IBM. Here we are only, here we are restricting ourselves with uh, the success stories of the three softwares which we are going to study. But optimization has been used in many commercial applications apart from this. So, you can also get some uh, resources from this Google OR tools. So, Google has this uh, web page, right. So, wherein they have given lot of OR tools which are freely av available. In the last 3 to 4 slides, we just showed you the commercial applications, right, uh, where the tools which we are going to discuss as part of this course have been used. So, now let us look into some of the interesting optimization problems that are widely uh, stated, right. So, this traveling salesman problem, a traveling person has to uh, tour n cities. So, in this case, so for example, let us consider this case wherein there are uh, e cities. So, there are 5 cities, city A, B, C, D, E. Right, and there is a cost associated with each city. So, if we travel from city A to city B, the cost is 5. If we travel from city A to city E, the cost is 2. If we travel from city A to city D, the cost is 3. So, if we travel from city E to city D, the cost is let us say 1, this is let us say 4, this is let us say 8 and this is let us say 9 and this let us say it is 2. Right. So, this is the cost of travelling in between 2 cities. So, uh, the task is the travelling salesman has to visit all the cities right and come back to the city that started with and each city is to be visited exactly once so one one of the solution can be from city a to city b city b to city e city e to city c and city c to city d and return back to city a we know the cost associated with each uh, tour so a to b we know the cost is 5 b to e uh, B to E the cost is 4, E to C, E to C the cost is 2, C to D, C to D the cost is 9, D to A, right, D to A the cost is 3, right. So, the total cost is the summation of all this, right. Similarly, another tour can be instead of this person going to city B, let us say he decides to go to city D, right, and then to city E, then to city C, then to city B and then he comes back to city A. So, again there is a cost associated with each of this, right. So, again we can calculate what is the total cost, right. So, there is a different cost over here, there is a different cost over here. So, depending upon the route uh, the person takes, the cost is going to be different. So, the task here is to find out this path, that which path is to be chosen such that the total cost required to tour all the cities without repeating uh, any of them and again come back to the original starting point, uh, the, that cost has to be minimum. So, this is a classical problem, uh, it is known as travelling salesman problem. Right? So, there are various ways to solve this travelling salesman problem. Right? So, another problem is na, what is called as knapsack problem. So, in this knapsack problem, we have a hiker right, who wants to fill uh, the knapsack to a maximum value. So, let us say there are 10 items, each item is associated with a weight and it has a cost, right. So, I have 10 items, I index, I denotes the index W1, W2 all the way up to W10 and then we have C1, C2 all the way up to C10. So, C indicates the cost, right. So, now the person wants to fill as many items as possible in the bag, right and there is a weight constraint that the total weight of the knapsack has to be less than a given value, right. And for whatever value, whatever item he, he or she chooses to place uh, in the knapsack, uh, we can calculate the total value that he is carrying. Let us say uh, the uh, we have C1 is equal to 10, C2 is equal to 5, C3 is equal to 4, C4 is equal to 8. Let us say he decides to carry just C1 and C4. So, the value that he is carrying is only 18, 10 plus 8, 18 and corresponding to the first item there is also going to be a weight and for the fourth item there is going to be a weight. So, the weight that he is carrying going to carry is W1 plus W4, right. So, that total weight has to be less than what is prescribed, 
right. So now the task is which of the items can be chosen so that the weight constraint is respected as well as the person is able to carry the maximum value with himself or herself. So that is known as knapsack problem. Both traveling salesman and knapsack problem are optimization problem. There is something called as feasibility problem. So in feasibility problem, we do not have an objective that has to be minimized or maximized, right? but we have a set of constraints that need to be satisfied. right? So map coloring is one such uh, classical problem. So here there are six countries, right? as shown over here there are six countries, Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, Germany, Denmark and France. So the task is to color each country such that no two countries which are neighbors are colored with the same color. Right. So, we have four sets of color, blue, white, yellow, green. So, each of the six cities is to be colored by one of these four colors. Right. And the constraint is that no pair of neighboring countries should have the same color. Right. So, here uh, if you see there is no uh, objective which has to be minimized or maximized, but we have a set of constraints that have to be satisfied. So, the color of uh, Denmark and Germany cannot be the same because they are neighboring. The color of Germany. Netherlands or Germany, Belgium, Germany, Luxembourg cannot be same as they have they are neighbors. Right? Similarly, Netherlands cannot have the same color as Belgium, Germany or Denmark. Right? So, this is a feasibility problem. So, here we need to find the set of decision variables. As long as it satisfies the constraints which are given, it is sufficient. There is no objective which is to be maximized or minimized. So, feasibility problems are a subset of optimization problem. So, if we solve an optimization problem, the solution that which we get will be feasible, right? but the reverse is not true. The solution of a feasibility problem will be feasible for an optimization problem, but it need not be the best solution. Another classical uh, feasibility problem is Sudoku problem. Many of you would have solved the Sudoku problem. So, in the Sudoku problem, we have 81 squares, there are 9 rows and 9 columns. Right, 1 to 9 rows and 1 to 9 columns. So, there are a total of 80, 81 cells. Right? So, each cell is to be uh, filled with uh, integers from 1 to 9. Right? Remember, 0 is not allowed. Right? So, each row has to be filled with numbers, any number from 1 to 9, such that no two, no, no two numbers in the same column or no two numbers in the same row are identical. Right. So, for example, this is already filled with 9. So, I cannot use 9 to fill any other uh, empty cell in row 1. Right. Similarly, uh, this column if we see uh, this particular column, it already has a 6 and 1. So, the rest of the cells which we have over here can take any value from 1 to 9 except 1 and 6. Right. So, that is the constraint that no two values uh, in any row should be identical and no two values in any column should be identical. right? And there are these 9 squares. So, here if you see this is the first square, second square, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth and ninth. Right? So, each of the square is going to have 9 cells and the values in the 9 in these 9 cells need to be unique. So, for example, this cell if you see, right? so there are 9 cells and uh, we have already used 3, 6, 9, 7. Right? So, the remaining values are 1, 2, 4, 5, 8. Right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 is already there, 8, 9. So, these 5 boxes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 have to be filled with these values. Again, the row and column constraints need to be respected. Right? So, for example, 2 we cannot fill this box with 2 because 2 is already there in that row. right? So, this is Sudoku problem. There is no objective as such over here, there are only constraints. So, a Sudoku problem can have uh, more than one solution. right? So, for example, for this problem there are 3 solutions. right? So, all these 3 solutions are unique. right? So, consider these 2 solutions. Here it is 1 phi, here it is phi 1 and again here it is phi 1 and here it is 1 phi. Right? So, these 2 solutions are unique solutions. Right. Um, so, both of these solutions are equally good for this feasibility problem. Right. Similarly, if we compare the solution 3, if we call this as solution 3 and if we call this as solution 2. Right. So, here if we see this is also phi 1, this is also phi 1, this is also 1 phi, this is also 1 phi. Right. But the change happens here. 
So, here it is 3 8, here it is 8 3 and this is 8 3 over here and this is 3 8 over here, right. So, all these 3 solutions S 1, S 2, S 3 are feasible solutions for this Sudoku problem, right. However, any feasibility problem can be converted into an optimization problem, right. Right now, I can say that I want to fill this box, right, satisfying all the constraints which we discussed so far How, and we want this value to be maximum, right. So, let us say if this box is represented, since there are 81 cells, right, uh, let us say I, this box is represented by 9 comma 9 or x 99. This is the name of a variable, right. So, if I denote the value filled, if I denote the cell as x 99, right. So, it can take either a value of 1 over here as shown over here, phi as shown over here or phi as shown over here, right. Then this solution is not optimal, right, because we wanted to maximize this value, right. Whereas, these two solutions are equally good for this optimization problem. Remember, first we discussed feasibility problem. Feasibility problem, we had to obey only the constraints, right. Uh, so, all the solutions, all the three solutions are equally good. Then we converted into an optimization problem. In optimization problem, we said that all the, so all the constraints need to be satisfied. On top of that, we said that the last box, right, denoted by x99 should have the maximum possible value, right. Once we say that, then S1 is no longer the optimal solution because it has a value 1, whereas solution 2 and solution 3 have a value of 5. So, we would not prefer solution 1 if we had an objective maximize x 99, okay. Whereas, solution 2 and solution 3 are equally good solution even for that optimization problem. So, that is the difference between a feasibility problem and an optimization problem. Now, we just we just saw that this problem can be converted into an optimization problem, right. So, here what we have are two approaches, right. So, this is one approach 1 and this is approach 2. This is a mixed integer linear programming formulation, right. So, this is an optimization problem. Here we can either add uh, a objective function, right, that one of the variable has to be maximum or minimum or we can just say maximize phi, right. So, obviously, this does not make sense because this is a scalar, it is going to be phi, but these are constraints, right. So, this problem can be mathematically formulated into a mixed integer linear programming problem. In fact, this is actually ILP, it is not even mixed integer linear programming, it is just integer linear programming because all the variables will take only uh, integer values, right. So, that is going to be one approach, right, wherein this whatever we discussed can be mathematically translated into these equations, right. So, that is the modeling part. Any optimization problem is going to have uh, first a modeling part, right. Once we have the model, it is only then we apply any optimization techniques to solve. So, this is one approach wherein the Sudoku problem is converted into a, a integer linear programming and then solve. This is another approach right called as constraint programming. We will not be discussing constraint programming as part of uh, this course, right, uh, but we thought since it, this is an introduction lecture, we will at least let you know that there are other techniques also, right. So, CP stands for constraint programming and the Sudoku problem is much easier to model for constraint programming, right. So, you do not need to worry about how did these equations come as of now, right, when we are discussing uh, mixed integer linear programming, we will let you know how these equations were uh, arrived at, right. So, right now from this slide you just need to understand that there are feasibility problems, there are optimization problem. Any feasibility problem can be converted into an optimization problem, right. So, if we know how to solve an optimization problem, we can solve feasibility problems, right. So, now let us formally look into the optimization in and its components. So, optimization uh, as you know, uh, it is the selection of best choice. Right. When we say best choice, it has to be based on some criteria. If we are going to say select the best choice, that invariably means that we have a set of alternatives from which we have to select the best choice, right. So, that decision is called as decision variables. So, we need to decide something. So, in optimization, we will be calling it as a decision variable, right. Uh, objective function uh, is a relation of decision variables, which is what we want to either uh, minimize or maximize or in general, we say optimize. 
and we have constraints uh, which are restrictions on the decision variables. So broadly we have three components, one is decision variables, other is objective function and the third one is constraint. So constraints limit uh, what we can do, right? Um, objective function is what we want to maximize or minimize and decision variables are those which we can actually change, right? So the point is that we need to find out the optimal value of the decision variables, right? So one classical optimization problem that many of us might uh, have solved is uh, selecting the cheapest flight to travel from one city to another city, right? So in that case, the decision variable is to select a flight, right? So these are the decision variables, right? So the decision variable as such is which flight to select. So in this case, if we see the minimum cost is 6355, right? So that is the optimal decision with respect to minimizing the cost. So the nature of the decision variable, objective function and constraints uh, helps in the classification of problems and in many times uh, and at times uh, even it helps in the classification of uh, techniques. Right? So let us look into each of the component uh, in a little bit more detail. The formulation of an optimization problem starts with identifying the decision variable. So uh, because we need to know uh, what is that can be changed so as to improve the objective function. So if you are not allowed to alter anything in that case, there is uh, nothing to optimize. So for example, if we tell that uh, x has to take a value of 2, right, then there is no choice that has to be made for x. But if it is said that x can take any value in the real domain, then we have a set of alternatives for, from which we need to choose what is the best value for x. Right? So this decision variable uh, relates the objective function and constraints. So the decision variables can be continuous. So for example, here if x is the decision variable and if f of x is the objective function, right? So x can take any value between 0 and 25. So in that case, x is continuous. The lower bound of x is 0 and the upper bound of x is 25. So x, is, x, x can vary from 0 to 25. Our task is to find out the value of x for which something uh, the function is either minimum or maximum. At times, the variable can be uh, discontinuous. So for example, if let's say this is 5, this is 10, this is 20 and this is 30, right? So in this case, this variable x1 uh, can take any value between 5 to 10, right? And can take any value between 20 to 30, but it cannot take a value which is greater than 10, right? And it cannot take a value which is less than 20, right? Greater than 20, 10 and so x greater than 10 and x uh, less than 20 is not allowed, right? Whereas x in between uh, 5 and 10 is permissible and x between 20 and 30 is uh, permissible, right? So between 10 and 20, there is a discontinuity. So for integer variables, uh, only the integer values are allowed. So for example, 1 is allowed, 2 is allowed, uh, 3 is allowed for x1, 4 is allowed, 5 is allowed, uh, but 1.1 is not allowed or 2.8 is not allowed, right? Only the integers are allowed, right? So in this case, x1 can vary between 1 and 5, the, only the integer values, right? So the decision variable can be continuous, semi-continuous, or it can be a integer, or it can even be a set. So for example, we need to decide which color is to be used to paint a country on the map, right? So there we have options of uh, co colors, right? So red, blue, green, yellow. So the decision variable can be set also. In most real life problem, uh, the decision variables are bounded, but mathematically a decision variable can also be an unbounded variable. So now that we have done a decision variable, let's move on to the objective function, right? So the objective function is the criteria with respect to which the de decision variables are op to be optimized. So our task is to determine the values of the decision variable so that a function known as objective function is either minimum or maximum. Right. So every point in the decision variable space. So for example, if we have a two variable problem, x1 and x2, right? And let's say if this uh, portion is the feasible region, then every point in the feasible region has a particular scalar value called as objective function, right? So for example, let us say f is equal to uh, x1 square plus 3x2. If this is our objective function, then for any, va any value of x1 and x2, there is a unique value of f. Right? So a point in the search space, so x1 and x2 constitutes the search space because we are looking for the optimal values for x1 and x2 in its domain. Right? So every point over here uh, has a corresponding scalar value 
for its objective function. So now if we are given two solutions, let us say this solution is over here, corresponds to over here and this solution corresponds to over here and let us say this is uh, 3 and this let us say this is 8, right. So if the optimization problem is to maximize f, then this solution is better and if the optimization problem is to minimize f, then this solution is better, right. So comp comparing two solutions is nothing but finding out the minimum of those two uh, objective function values. So similar to decision variables, uh, the objective function can be continuous or semi-continuous. So here we have an example of a continuous function, right. So as x varies from uh, let us say point A to point B, f of x is continuous. Over here we have shown a, a discontinuous function that the objective function is defined from this particular x to this particular x but there is no definition for the objective function in this region, right. So over here again it is defined in this region but there is a discontinuity in between. So the objective function can be continuous or uh, semi-continuous. So for this course we will be most of the time we will be either talking about a minimization problem or a maximization problem. So any minimization problem can be converted to a maximization problem or vice versa by multiplying the objective function with a uh, negative sign. So for example, if the problem is to maximize f of x, the solution for this problem is the same as the solution for minimizing minus f of x, right. So the value of the objective function might differ but the value of the solution x would be the same. So for example, you can look at this figure. So this is the curve, the top curve is for uh, f of x. Right? this curve is for f of x and the bottom curve is for minus uh, f of x, right. So if you see that is a mirror image, right. So the minimum of this function f of x is located over here. Uh, the value at which the minimum occurs is x star, right. So at x star if you see uh, it is also the same point at which the maximum of this uh, minus f of x occurs, right. So x star remains the same, right. So the objective function would be this. Uh, if you are minimizing f of x, so let us say if you get 2 over here, over here you would get minus 2, right. So but x star would be the same. So if we know that we are actually, let us say we had a uh, optimization problem which said uh, maximize f of x and we got a value of let us say 2 and if we minimize it, minimize, if we do minus minimize, uh, if we do minimize negative of f of x, we will get a solution minus 2. So this can be brought back to this actual value by just multiplying a with a negative sign. There won't be any change at the point at which the maxima or the minima occurs, right. So x star remains the same and that is the task, right, to find out the uh, value of x at which a function is either maximum or minimum. So the objective function just like the decision variables can be bounded or unbounded. And uh, there are some special problem called as feasibility problems in which there is no objective function, right, but there are a set of constraints uh, that need to be satisfied. So for example, Sudoku problem is a uh, example for feasibility problem. We did briefly discuss how this feasibility problem can be converted into an optimization problem, right. So in feasibility problem we only have constraints. In an optimization problem, we may or may not have restrictions on the decision variable. Uh, now that we have discussed decision variables and objective function, let us move on to constraints, right. So broadly constraints can be of two types, one is uh, inequality constraints and the other one is equality constraints. So inequality constraints usually arise when we have resource constraints that something has to be less than or equal to something or something requires to be greater than or equal to something. Right. So in general they are denoted by g of x less than 0 but it can be converted into greater than 0 or uh, greater than equal to 0 uh, by just multiplying with a negative sign, right. So if x1 plus x2 is less than equal to 10, if this is the requirement then, then it is the same as prescribing minus x1 x plus x2 is greater than or equal to minus 10, not plus 10 but uh, minus 10 over here, right. So just like objective function. Uh, the constraints can also be converted from less than equal to form to greater than equal to form or vice versa greater than equal to form to less than equal to form by multiplying with a negative sign on both the sides of the equation. So equality constraints are uh, usually considered uh, very difficult to satisfy. In general they are denoted by h of x is equal to 0, right. So here we have two examples that x1 plus x2 is equal to 3 
and uh, over here x e to the power minus x square minus y square should be equal to 5. So, the task over here is to come up for if this is our constraint, the task here is to come up with the values of x1 and x2 such that if we add both of this number, it should be exactly equal to 3, right. So, 3.000001 is not allowed and 2.99999 is also not allowed, right. So, that is why these constraints are very difficult to satisfy. So, usually some tolerance is given, right. So, this equality constraint uh, usually uh, tolerance is given to that. So, when we actually start solving a problem, we will look into that. So, based on these constraints, uh, a solution can be classified either as feasible solution or an infeasible solution. So, if a solution satisfies all the constraints in a problem, it is said to be a feasible solution and if a, in, uh, and if a solution does not satisfy even one constraint, it is said to be an infeasible solution. So, we may ha have 100 constraints, a solution may satisfy 99 constraints and may be failing on uh, one constraint, uh, failing in the sense it is not able to satisfy uh, the requirement. Even in that case, the solution is to be classified as infeasible solution, right. And again constraints can be classified as hard constraints and soft constraints, right. So, hard constraints are those that have to be satisfied so that a solution has to be accepted. Soft constraints are those which can be allowed to uh, relax to some extent to accept a solution, right. So, just let us look at couple of examples to understand the feasibility of solution. So, here we have uh, objective function, right. So, the decision variables are x1 and x2, right. So, now we are supposed to find out the values of x1 and x2 such that when those values are plugged into this part, that should result in a value which is greater than or equal to 300. Right. So, if it, if, does, if it does not happen, then the solution is said to be an infeasible solution. So, for example, consider the solution x1 is equal to 3 and x2 is equal to 10 and another solution x1 is equal to 8 and x2 is equal to 6. So, if we calculate the objective function for uh, both of this, right. So, if I plug 3 comma 10 in this uh, expression, right, uh, we will get uh, 7.05. And if we plug this 8 comma 6, we will get a value of 16.34. And if we calculate this right hand side of this constraint that pi x1 square x2 by 4, if we calculate that part, it turns out to be 70.69 uh, for solution 1 and in solution 2 it turns out to be 301.59, right. So, if we look at the objective function f1 and f2. 7.05 is better than 16.34 because our objective is to minimize. However, this solution uh, does not satisfy the constraint that 70.69 is not greater than equal to 300, right. So, this solution is an infeasible solution, right. It violates the uh, constraint, it is an infeasible solution. Whereas, this solution, the solution S2 is a feasible solution since it satisfies the constraint, right. So, solution 2 would be preferred to solution 1, right, despite the fact that f1 uh, is better than f2 because the problem is minimizing. So, a feasible solution is to be preferred uh, to an infeasible solution, right. No matter how good is the objective function value for an infeasible solution, it does not matter uh, because it does not satisfy the constraints uh, which is a requirement. So, now let us look at uh, what is a bounded and an unbounded problem, right. So, let us say we have a function f which is 3 x 1 plus 2 x 2, right and we are supposed to minimize that, right. So, and if there are no restrictions of on x 1 and x 2, then x 1 and x 2 can take a value of minus infinity and minus infinity, right and the problem, uh, the objective function value itself will be minus infinity. So, this problem is known as an unbounded problem. So, the minimum value of f is uh, minus infinity, right. So, now if we put constraints on the decision variable. So, the decision variables x1 and x2, here they were uh, unrestricted, right. So, x1 and x2 could have taken any values between minus infinity to plus infinity. Now, we have restricted that x1 has to be between 100 and 700 and x2 has to be between 50 and 100, right. So, we have this line, this, this is x1, this is x2. So, x1 has to be uh, greater than or equal to 100. So, we have this line, right and then x1 has to be less than or equal to 700. So, we have this, this line, right. So, x1 the feasible region of x1 is from here to here. Now, we plot the feasible region of x2, 
So, x2 has to be greater than or equal to 50. So, any value over here is infeasible with respect to x2. With respect to x1 it is feasible, but with respect to x2 it is infeasible. Similarly, x2 has to be less than or equal to 100, right. So, any value over here is infeasible with respect to uh, x2, right. So, the feasible region now is bounded. So, it is in this region that we are supposed to locate the best solution, right. So, um, in this case it happens that uh, this objective function 3x1 plus 2x2 will have a minimum value uh, of 400 at this point. Any other point if you calculate uh, inside this uh, entire feasible region, uh, you would see that it has a uh, objective function value which is actually greater than 400. So, since we are looking at a minimization problem, the least value that we can have for this problem with these constraints is uh, 400. Right? So, now let us add one more constraint that the values of x1 and x2 should satisfy this constraint that x1 minus 3 x2 should be greater than or equal to 400. So, to graphically plot what we will plot is uh, x1 minus 3 x2 is equal to 400. Remember our constraint is greater than or equal to 400, but we are plotting this line x1 minus 3 x2 equal to 400. This line can be plotted. This is a region right greater than or equal to 400 is a region. So, let us uh, so in order to plot this line uh, what we can do is uh, we can take x1 to be 0 right if we take x1 to be 0 right so then minus 3 x2 is equal to 400 which implies x2 is equal to 133.33 similarly so that gives one point 0 comma 133.33 that is one point the second point is we'll keep x2 as 0 and calculate the value of x1 so it will come turn out to be 0 comma 400 so now we have two points right so we can draw this line over here which is shown right so that line passes through 0 comma 133.33 and 0 uh, and 400 comma 0 right so that line is plotted and so this feasible region which we had over here this rectangle has now been uh, reduced to this particular region right this shaded uh, part which is shown shown here right so that is because uh, in this region x1 minus 3 x2 is greater than 400 whereas in the region above this right it will not satisfy this constraint mm, x1 minus 3 x2 will be less than or equal to 400 so you can try out some values so for example if you substitute this particular value 100 comma 100 in this equation right so 100 minus 3 3 times 100 right uh, that will be minus 200 which is not greater than 400 so this point is to is not feasible so similarly uh, all the points above this line are infeasible right and over here we are restricted by this line x1 is 700 and over here we are restricted by this line uh, x2 equal to 50. So, this uh, triangle which we see here uh, that is the feasible region. So, as you can see as we add a constraint the feasible region uh, decreases right. So, here there are two types of constraints one is redundant constraint and one is non redundant constraint right. So, a redundant constraint does not help you to uh, reduce the feasible region, a non redundant constraint helps you to reduce the feasible region. So, the optimal uh, solution for this problem is uh, x1 is equal to 550, x2 is equal to 50. So, if we plug these two values in this objective function 3x1 plus 2x2, we will get a uh, objective function value of 1750, right. So, when we do linear programming, this problem is a linear programming uh, problem. When we actually do linear programming, uh, you will see that how did we arrive at this solution. Uh, right now, what you need to understand is uh, what is a feasible region and what is an infeasible region. So, at times we can even have bounds on the objective function, though it is very rare, but it is possible, right. So, in that case, if we see this is the line uh, 3x1 plus 2x2. So, just like we plotted x1 minus 3x2 is equal to 400. Uh, we can also plot a line 3x1 plus 2x2 is equal to 1800, right. So, if we plot this line, it will turn out to be this line, right. So, now the feasible reg region is even reduced. So, here if you see this star which is over here uh, has actually moved over, right. So, the optimal solution is 1800. Here we are limited by the objective function. 1750 is possible 
that solution is possible. But since we have this additional constraint that the fitness function has to be greater than or equal to 1800, right? Uh, the solution actually uh, is 1800, right? So this solution becomes infeasible. 1750 becomes infeasible because there is a constraint that the fitness, uh, the objective function has to be greater than or equal to 1800. So in this case, we had bounds on the decision variable. So over here, there is a small uh, typo, right? So minus 3x2 is equal to 400. So if we are to calculate x2, it has to be minus 400 by 3, and this has to be minus 133 by 3, right? So the line is still drawn correctly, but just that we had a typo over there. So in the previous example, we had seen uh, the decision variables, they were explicitly bounded. However, it is not necessary that the decision variables need to be explicitly bounded for the problem to be a bounded problem. So the objective function is minimize 3x1 plus 2x2. The constraint is 2x1 plus x2 greater than 5. So we do the same thing that we, took it, we take it as tx1 plus x2 is equal to 5 and then take two values of x1, calculate the values of x2 and we'll be able to plot this line, right? So this line indicates 2x1 plus x2 equal to 5. And uh, similar to the calculation that we discussed uh, uh, in the previous slide, this is this would be the area of feasibility. Similarly, we can also plot these two lines, x1 plus x2 is equal to 4, and we take two values of x1, determine what is the value of x2, and plot it, right? So this line is going to be uh, x1 plus x2 is equal to 4, and this line is going to be x1 minus x2 equal to 2. So any region below this x1 plus x2 curve, uh, x1 plus x2 equal to 4 line is feasible region. So this is a feasible region, right? So this is also a feasible region. Similarly, uh, for the other for the other line, x1 minus x2 is less than equal to 2. So this is the feasible region, right? So if we plot all the three feas uh, all the feasible regions of the constraint, we will be left with only the shaded regions, right? The because let's say uh, any value which is feasible for this x1 plus x2 equal to 4 need not be feasible for 2x1 plus x2 uh, greater than or equal to 5. That is why some of the area which is feasible for, uh, let's say, this constraint is not feasible for this constraint. Right? So the common area which is feasible for all the three constraints is our feasible region. So the optima has to be located in this feasible region. So here if you see, x1 and x2 can vary from minus infinity to infinity, right? There is no explicit bound on x1 and x2, still the problem is a bounded problem. So for us to declare a problem is, uh, is feasible or not, we need to actually look into the nature of the constraints, right? Merely by looking into the bounds of the variables, it is not possible to say whether the problem is bounded or unbounded for an arbitrary optimization problem. So this is a case wherein we show uh, an infeasible problem that the conf constraints are conflicting. So over here also the over here the objective function is minimize 2x1 plus 3x2 and the constraints are 4x1 plus x2 is less than 5, 3x2 is greater than or equal to 4 and x1 minus x2 is greater than or equal to 3 and again x1 and x2 can vary from minus infinity to plus infinity, right? So if we plot these three lines, again plotting the lines is, as we discussed previously, we take we convert this into a equality constraint, generate two points and since it is a linear equation, we draw straight lines, right? In this case, the feasible region for each constraint is uh, indicated by this dotted arrows, right? So for the constraint x1 minus x2 greater than 3, this is the feasible region below the constraint. For this curve 3x2, for this line 3x2 greater than or equal to 4. Right? This, is, this is that line 3x2, 3x2 equal to 4. Right? So basically what we are saying is x2 is equal to 1.33. So x2 has to be greater than 1.33. So it is this region. In this region, x, the value of x2 is greater than 1.33. Similarly, we plot the line x1 minus x2 equal to 3. Right? So we, this region is the infeasible, uh, this region is the feasible region. Right? So now if we see there is no common area for this three constraints. In this case, we call the problem as infeasible problem. So another easy way to understand is, let's say there is a constraint which says x has to be greater than or equal to 2 and another constraint which says x has to be uh, less than or equal to 1, right? So any value of x which is less than or equal to 1 is feasible for this constraint. For this constraint, any value of x which is actually greater than or equal to 2 is feasible, right? So if I have to satisfy both these constraints, there is no single value of x which will satisfy both of these equations, right? So in this case, these two equations put together make the problem infeasible. Uh, another 
term which we will be commonly using is uh, contours. So, contours are lines which have identical objective function value. So, for example, here if we see if I if we take x1 is equal to 2 and x2 is equal to 4, it will give objective function value of 20. If we take x1 is equal to 4, x2 is equal to 2, we will get an objective function value of 20. If we take x1 is equal to 1 and fix f to be 20, right, we can actually find out what is the value of x2. So, similarly, we can generate many points and then we can plot. So, this is x1, this is x2, right. So, all these values can be plotted 2, 4, 4, 2, 1, whatever we get over here 3, something, 0, something. So, we would get a curve like this. So, this is called as contour. So, all the points on this curve have a function value of 20, right. So, similarly, uh, we can plot contours for 10, we can plot contours for 5. So, similarly, we can plot contours for other values, right. So, this is known as contour plot. So, this shows us uh, how the objective function behaves in the search space. So, the, our search space is x1 is equal to minus 5 to 5 and x2 is equal to minus 5 to 5. So, in this region, how the objective function varies, right. So, all the points in this curve will have an objective function value of 20. All the points in on this uh, contour will have a uh, va function value of 5. Right? So, uh, very often we will be referring to this contour plot and then we have something called as realizations, right. So, realizations are those solutions which have the same objective function value, but different decision variable value. So, for example, uh, if you remember the slide uh, in which the flight costs were given, you may have two different flights which have which uh, which may have the same cost, right. So, from, from the perspective of the objective function which is cost in our case, the value is same, but the decision variables can be different, right. So, those are called as realizations, right. So, for example, if we have this problem uh, maximize f is equal to x1, x2 subject to these two constraints x1 plus x2 should be equal to 3 and x1 minus x2 should be less than equal to 1 and bounded by the constraint that x1 and x2 should be greater than or equal to 0. So, if we plot that, so this is the line x1 plus x2 equal to 3, right and this is the line x1 minus x2 uh, equal to 1, right. So, since this is a less than equal to 1, so it this is the feasible region as indicated by these dotted arrows. Right. And the feasible region is also this line, this x1 plus x2 equal to 3, uh, because the points that are lying on this straight line x1 plus x2 equal to 3, only those points satisfy this constraint, right. So, the intersection point of these two constraint is over here and remember this entire region is feasible, right. Uh, uh, this entire region is uh, feasible because it has x1 minus x2 is less than equal to 1. So, we have one more point over here in addition to this, right. So, those two points are x1 is equal to 1, x2 is equal to 2 and x1 is equal to 2 and x2 equal to 1. So, at both these places, the objective function value is 2, right. So, these are called as realizations, right, same objective function value, but different uh, decision variables, right. In one case, x1 is, in one case, the solution is 1 comma 2 and in the other case, the solution is 2 comma 1. So, this is an example uh, again for uh, realization, right. So, here uh, we need to design a can, right. What we can vary is the uh, diameter and the height, right. And the diameter and height uh, has to be between 0 and 31. So, the constraint is that the can should have a volume of at least 300 ml, right. So, the volume is given by pi d square h by 4. So, this has to be greater than equal to 300 because we have at least, right. So, if it is more than 300, it is fine, but we want at least 300 ml. So, that is why we have this greater than equal to constraint and the objective is to minimize the material cost of the can, right. So, that if you see, uh, C denotes the cost and this will correspond to the material cost of the can. So, in this case, if we take uh, the diameter as 8 centimeter and if we take the height as 10 centimeter, the objective function value would be 22.87 and if we take the diameter as 5 centimeter and the height as 19.9 centimeter, the objective function value which is the cost would still be 22.87. So, the can can either look like this or it can look like this, right. So, here uh, the height is smaller uh, than the this can, 
but in both cases the cost is 22.87 right so depending upon other constraints one can choose either this solution or this solution right without compromising on the objective function value so that is why it is good to know the realizations not only the optimal solution but also many instances in which the same optimal cost can be obtained now let us look at uh, monotonic function and convex functions right so we will be using this term very often so monotonic functions are functions which are either continuously increasing or decreasing with respect to x so for example in this case if we increase as we increase x the value of let us say this is f of x keeps increasing right so it has a monotonic uh, nature to it here in the second fig plot if we in the second figure if we see if we keep increasing x f of x continuously decreases right so this is also monotonic this is also monotonic it does not matter whether it is increasing or decreasing as long as as long as it is consistently increasing or decreasing whereas this third plot is an example of a non monotonic function right so here if we see as we increase x f of x is first decreasing till here and as we keep increasing x f of x is increasing and again as we keep uh, uh, increasing x f of x is decreasing right so here if you see from here to here uh, from in this region the function is monotonically decreasing in this region the function is monotonically increasing and again in this region the function is monotonically decreasing when we have functions behaving like this those are known as non monotonic functions we will also be using this term convex functions very often right so convex functions most of you would be knowing convex function right so convex function if we take any two points in the line right so for example if i take this point and if i take this point and if i were to draw a straight line connecting these two points right so the line would be above the curve right so if that happens that is known as a convex function so that is the geometrical uh, interpretation of convex function mathematically let's say if this is if i took two points x1 and x2 right so their uh, uh, their corresponding fitness function value is f of x1 and f of x2 right so uh, as of so we have two points x1 its corresponding y value or the function value is f of x1 we have x2 its corresponding function value is f of x2 and if we take any point right so let's say we take this point x3 right so x3 is a linear combination of x1 and x2 right so uh, we can express x3 is equal to gamma x1 plus 1 minus gamma x2 right so and again we can calculate f of x3 so f of x3 is nothing but f of gamma x1 plus 1 minus gamma x2 right so that is what is written over here so this is nothing but f of x3 right so that would be less than if that is less than gamma times f of x1 plus 1 minus gamma times f of x2 then the function is a convex function so as you can see a convex function uh, will have only one point at which the gradient vanishes right so we will have only one optimal solution right so the local optima itself will be the global optima so whenever we have a convex function we it is sufficient if we find the stationary point and for th at that stationary point the function is bound to be minimum right so it's not necessary to uh, calculate the higher derivatives and then we have unimodal functions and multimodal functions right so unimodal functions are those for some value of m if the function is monotonically increasing for x less than m and monotonically decreasing for x greater than or equal to m right so these are examples of monotonically uh, uh, these are examples of unimodal function so if you see we basically have one peak right so till this point uh, the function is so this is our m this is our m so till that point the function is actually increasing after that it is decreasing right so we basically have this uh, one peak so those are called as uni unimodal function right similarly what we have shown is over here for maximization right so for minimization it can be it continuously decreases till a particular value and then increases beyond that value so this is also a uni unimodal uh, function right so for a unimodal function uh, the maximum value of f of x is f of m right so here if we see uh, the value of the function is maximum at m right so that's a nice property about uh, unimodal function right and it has only one one peak right so there are no other local maxima 
these are examples of multimodal functions right so for example as x increases uh, here it's it is increasing then it is decreasing and still if x is increasing this is starting to increase right so here if we see we have uh, multiple peaks over here and multiple val uh, multiple uh, values over here right so this plot shows in one dimensional so here the plot is between x and f of x here it is between uh, x1 x2 and f so it's a 3d plot so now if we see traps are there right so there are lot of valleys there are lot of peaks if our problem is to maximize is to find out the peak that is that has the best value uh, despite there being so many other peaks and if our problem is to minimize the objective function then our task is to find out the values of x1 and x2 at which the objective function has a uh, lowest value so that is unimodal and multimodal functions so most real life optimization problems are multi multimodal in nature so optimal solutions can be uh, said to be either uh, local or global right so what we are discussing here is with, is with respect to uh, minimization problem uh, but the same thing can be extended to maximization problem so local optima means the smallest function value in its neighborhood right so for example if we take this point uh, in its neighborhood it has the least value right same thing this point it has the least uh, value in, in its neighborhood right so all those four points are uh, local optima right so for a problem uh, there can be multiple local optima for global optima it is the smallest function value in the entire feasible region so the difference is over here so local optima is the smallest function value in its neighborhood whereas global optima is the smallest function value in the entire feasible region right uh, so here if we see out of these four points one two three and four right uh, all the four points are local optima right because they are the le they have the least value in their neighborhood whereas this particular point uh, is actually lowest among the entire feasible region so if our feasible region is from here to here for f of x uh, for a uni for a single variable optimization problem then we can see that the best solution is over here these are also uh, uh, local optima but this is the global optima right so if the function is convex right only one global optima exists and there will be no local optima right so that's why we looked into a convex function just to understand what is uh, global optima so if our function is convex in nature then if we are able to find an optima we do not need to worry about whether it is global optima or local optima because there is only one optimal solution right if the function is not convex or the function is multimodal then most algorithms fail to determine the global optimal solution that is why non linear programming uh, is still a open area of research to consolidate whatever we have seen so far so we had seen what are the components of an optimization problem we have decision variable objective function and uh, constraints right so decision variable can be either continuous or it can be semi continuous it can be integer or a set objective function uh, can be continuous or discontinuous we saw how we can convert a maximization problem into a minimization problem or vice versa in constraints we saw basically there are two types of uh, constraints uh, one is inequality constraints and another one is equality constraints so inequality constraints are of the form g of x is less than equal to 0 if we happen to have a constraint which is actually having let's say 3x square plus 5y is greater than 10 greater than or equal to 10 then uh, we can multiply that equation by a minus sign on both sides and the inequality sign would get reversed right so that is what we saw as components of optimization problem then we looked into certain features about uh, optimization problem we saw what is boundary region uh, what is a feasible solution what is an infeasible solution what are realizations then we looked into what are uh, unimodal functions and multimodal function we saw what is a convex function and then we also tried to understand uh, what is a local optima and a global optima the global optima is what we are interested because we are interested in the value of the objective function uh, which is the least in the entire uh, feasible region now let us look into how do we classify uh, optimization problems right uh, this is a typical optimization uh, problem right so uh, let's say we have a objective function uh, which involves x which stand for the continuous variable 
and y which stands for uh, binary variables or integer variables. So, even if we have sets that can be converted into uh, integer variable. Right. So, basically if we have a objective function which involves both the continuous variable and binary variable. Similarly, we have constraints g uh, which involve the continuous variable and binary variable and inequality constraint. So, this is inequality constraint, this is equality constraint and then we have uh, bounds for each of the variable. So, x belongs to the real domain or we can have a bound constraint that a particular value of x can be between let us say 5 and 10, let us say if we have two variables x1 is between x1 has to be between 5 and 10 and x2 has to be between let us say 50 and 70. Right? So, those are the bound constraints. Similarly, for the integer variables or binary variables, we can have that y can y1 can take values uh, 1, 2, 3, uh, whereas y2, another variable, can take values uh, 8, 9, uh, let us say 10, 11, 12, and so on. Right? So, this is a generic representation of an optimization problem. We have continuous variable, we have discrete variable. Uh, we have inequality constraints, we have equality constraints. Right? So, here if we see uh, these three are actually functions f of x comma y, g of x comma y and h of x comma y are actually functions. Right? So, function we can classify as linear or non-linear and decision variable we will just restrict ourselves to whether it is continuous variable or integer variable. Right. So, we are as of now we are ignoring for classifying these problems, we are ignoring the semi-continuous variable. So, variables can be continuous or discrete right, or integer, right. discrete is, stands for integer also. The objective function can be linear or non-linear, the constraints can be linear or non-linear. So, depending upon this, we have 5 classes of problem, right. broadly 5 classes of problem. One is called as linear programming. So, linear programming as the name indicates, right, the functions are going to be linear, right. So, the objective function is going to be linear, the constraints are going to be uh, linear, right. So, non-linearity is not allowed either in the objective function or in the constraints and since it does not mention anything about the nature of the decision variable. So, when we say linear programming, we are not refer, we are not explicitly specifying what is the nature of the decision variable. So, by default it means only continuous variable, discrete variables are not allowed. So, a linear programming is a problem in which the objective function and uh, the constraints are linear and the variables are continuous. No non-linearity is allowed in the constraints or the objective function and the variables cannot be discrete. So, that is linear programming. So, similarly non-linear programming, the variables cannot be discrete. Uh, we are not explicitly specifying anything about the nature of the decision variable in the name. Right? So, the decision variable have to be only continuous. The objective function can be either linear or non-linear and the constraints can be either linear or non-linear. Right? So, it is possible that uh, some of the constraints are linear, some of the constraints are non-linear, but if we have even one single constraint which is a non-linear, uh, which is non-linear, uh, it falls under the category of non-linear programming. Uh, for integer linear programming, uh, the name itself specifies integer. Right? So, that means only discrete variables are allowed, continuous variables are not allowed and since it is linear programming, uh, objective function and constraints should be only linear, right? non-linearity is not allowed uh, in integer linear programming. Mm -hmm. Then we have mixed integer linear programming. So, as the name indicates mixed integer, right? so that means continuous variables are also there, discrete variables are also there, uh, linear programming. Right. So, non-linear objective function is not allowed, non-linear constraint is not allowed, the objective function has to be linear and the constraint have to be linear. In mixed integer non-linear programming, right, uh, the variables, some of the variables can be continuous, some of the variables can be integer, the objective function can be either be linear or non-linear and the constraints can either be linear or non-linear. Right. So, these are the 5 categories of problem. Obviously, you can also have integer non-linear programming wherein uh, either the objective function or uh, the constraints are, wherein the objective function or the constraints are uh, non-linear in nature. So, this gives the consolidated uh, picture of whatever we have discussed. Now that we have classified problems, uh, there are various ways to classify optimization techniques. Right? For this course, we will classify broadly into three categories. One is mathematical programming techniques. 
metaheuristic techniques and what we call it as other techniques, right. So, this is something that we are not going to see as part of this course. So, in this course we will be primarily focusing on uh, metaheuristic techniques. We will also touch upon uh, mathematical programming techniques, right. So, mathematical programming techniques are based on geometrical properties of the problem. So, if it is uh, the algorithm themselves are designed uh, taking into account the nature of the problem. So, for example, for linear programming problem, we have something called as simplex algorithm. So, that explicitly exploits the fact that the objective function and the constraints are linear in nature, right. Um, similarly, nonlinear programming make use of the nature of the function to design the algorithm. So, some of the nonlinear programming techniques are uh, steepest descent Newton's method, quasi Newton method. Uh, for integer programming problems, we have branch and bound and cutting planes, right. Interior point algorithm can be used for linear programming as well as non-linear programming, right. So, here for this course, we will only be looking at uh, linear programming from the perspective of mathematical programming techniques. We will be looking into linear programming only with uh, simplex algorithm and for uh, mixed integer linear programming, we will be looking into uh, branch and bound. There are various other mathematical programming techniques for non-linear programming and mixed integer non-linear programming which we would not be covering in this course, right. From the perspective of metaheuristic techniques, so these are nature inspired techniques, right. So, we will be looking into genetic algorithm, particle swarm optimization, differential evolution, teaching learning based optimization, artificial bee colony optimization. Uh, we will be looking into these 5 techniques. Uh, there are obviously lot of other techniques uh, which come up every year, right, but we will be restricting it to uh, these techniques. So, these techniques do not necessarily exploit the structure of the problem. So, the way we solve a linear programming problem using metaheuristic technique is the same way we will be solving a nonlinear programming problem or a mixed integer linear programming problem or a mixed integer nonlinear programming problem. Uh, so, these techniques uh, consider the problem as uh, a black box optimization problem. So, we will look into it in detail uh, as and when we uh, start looking into metaheuristic techniques. So, just for the sake of our knowledge, let us also look into multi objective optimization, right. So, in single whatever we discussed so far was with respect to single objective optimization. In multi objective optimization, we have more than one objective. When we say more than one objective, that means the objectives are conflicting in nature. Conflicting in the sense like if we try to uh, improve uh, in one objective, we end up deteriorating the other objective and both the objectives are equally important, right. So, that is when we have multi objective uh, optimization, right. So, a classical example from uh, Professor Kalyan Mai Deb's book, right. So, here uh, someone wants to buy a car, 5 options uh, A, B, C, D, E. Right. So, uh, the cost of the cars are different and the comfort that it provides is also different. So, the cost of car A is somewhere around 1 uh, one K in some arbitrary monetary units and the comfort level that it provides is 30, 30 percent, right. Whereas, car E uh, is has a cost of 100 K and the comfort level it provides, provides is 90, 90 percent, right. So, if someone were to say that uh, their objective is to maximize uh, let us say uh, the comfort, then obviously car E is the best choice because the solutions A, B, C, D have a lower value of uh, the comfort, right. So, that is easy, uh, that is single objective optimization. Same way if someone were to say that minimizing cost is their objective, then it is easy to choose car A because it has the lowest cost. But if someone were to say that maximizing comfort and minimizing cost is their objective, then all these 5 solutions A, B, C, D, E are equally good, right. So, for example, if we take, uh, if we compare uh, car C uh, and car E. So, car C has a lower cost, right, but a lower comfort. So, C cannot be uh, eliminated when compared to car E. That is because, because the cost is lower for C and we want to minimize the cost. Whereas, car E cannot be uh, eliminated because the comfort is better than that for car C, right. So, all these 5 points are equally good and we have what is called as Pareto solutions, right, uh, or the set of non-dominating solutions, right. So, there is no solution which dominates these solutions, so non-dominating uh, solutions. So, similarly, if we go back to that previous example which we had that we want to select a flight 
right and the objective is to have the duration of the flight should be minimum as well as the cost should be minimum that both we want minimize f1 and minimize f2 f2 is price and f1 is let's say duration so for example these two if we consider 6211 6211 this takes 2 hours 15 minutes and this flight takes 2 hours 45 minutes so this solution can be eliminated because uh, we are not compromising on the cost right whereas we have a better uh, duration i mean lower duration with with this particular flight if we compare 6411 and 6211 obviously this is better in cost but this solution has a lower duration right so between this first two flights it's difficult to eliminate uh, any any particular solution again this solution can be eliminated this right because we have a solution which says 2 hours 45 minutes and the cost is 6211 here the cost is also higher the duration is also higher so this solution can be eliminated so here if we see again this solution uh, can be eliminated because we have a higher cost as well as the duration is uh, longer than this two so in this case we have only two solutions for two objectives whereas in this case in this car problem even for two objectives we had uh, five solutions right so it's not uh, in multi objective optimization very often students have this misconception that if there are two objectives then there are two solutions that is not the case right with two objectives you can have even zero solutions you can have infinite uh, solutions in the pareto front or you can have a discrete pareto front defined by a finite number of points so the search space in multi objective optimization and single objective optimization so in single objective optimization let's say we have a three variable problem x1 and x2 x3 and this shaded region let's say is the feasible region then any point in this feasible region actually corresponds to a scalar value in the objective function uh, in the objective function space right so this is just a linear uh, linear line right so it's much easier to say which solution is better so for example uh, let's say one solution is over here and another solution corresponds to this particular value if this is f1 and this is f2 and if the objective is to maximize then f2 is better than f1 so it's easy to make a make that call because uh, we are comparing only two scalar values right uh, in multi objective optimization every point in this search space x1 x2 x3 are the decision variable so every point over here actually corresponds to a point uh, in a if we have two objectives then it corresponds to a point in a two dimensional space right so this point is over here and this point is over here right here the search process is little bit more complicated because uh, we intend to get the set of non dominating solutions or the pareto solutions or the trade off solutions so formally we can define a pareto solution as that a solution s1 is set to dominate solution s2 so if we have two solutions s1 and s2 s1 is set to dominate s2 if both the following conditions are true so the first condition is that s1 is not worse than s2 in any of the objectives right so it is not definitely bad than s2 in any of the objectives and that s1 has to be strictly better than s2 in at least one of the objectives right so only then we can say s1 is dominating the solution s2 so if we are given these points uh, again there is a common misconception that uh, for two objective functions to be conflicting uh, one has to be maximum the other has to be minimum or it has to be min max right so that is not correct you can have two objective functions which both need to be maximized and yet they can be uh, conflicting right so this example shows you that thing uh, so for example these are the solutions these are the solution s1 s2 s3 s4 s5 what is shown over here is their objective function values right these are not the decision variable values for some let's say if it is a three variable problem uh, s1 has let's say 289 s2 has let's say 5 578 and then we have uh, two objective function f1 is equal to let's say some relation between x1 x2 x3 and f2 is a some relation between x1 x2 x3 right so if we plug these decision variable values into these objective function values we will get f1 and f2 for each of the solution so that is what is shown over here solution s1 has an objective function value of 9 and an objective function value of 2 uh, similarly the other solutions have the respective objective function values if we compare all these solutions so let's say let's compare s1 and s2 so we want to maximize so between s1 and s2 it is difficult to pick uh, a solution because Uh, s1 is 
better than S2 right in F1 whereas S2 is better than F1 right. So, if we do with 3 the same thing that S3 is better in F1, S1 is better than F2 because it has a value of 2. Over here if we see S4 completely dominates S1 because here we have 11 and 3 and we want to maximize uh, both of this. So, this S1 is definitely not a part of the Pareto solutions because there is this solution which will definitely uh, outrank S1. So, we would never choose S1 if we have S4 right. So, now that we have ruled out S1 let us look at S2 right. So, between S2 and S3 uh, we cannot make a call because S3 is better than F1, better in F1 and S2 is better in uh, F. Let us compare with S4. So, S2 does not lose out to S4 also because we have a 5 over here and a 3 over here right. Between S2 and S5 again S2 does not lose out right. So, S2 is definitely going to be the part of uh, Pareto front. So, similarly you can do the other calculation right. So, S3 will not lose out to S4 uh, because of this 12 being better right, but S3 will lose out to S5 because we have a 16 which is better than 12 and we have a 2 which is better than 1. So, S3 loses out to this. Now, we can compare S4 and S5 right. So, 11 and 16, 3 and 2 right. So, obviously S4 does not lose out to S5 right and the other comparisons were made. So, these 3 solutions form a part of non-dominated points right. So, for example, here if you see this solution S2, it had a poor objective function than S1 and S3 right because it is 8 and this is 9 and 12, but still S2 goes into the Pareto point S1 and S3 lose out because this S2 has better value of F2 which is why it survives right. So, suppose for example, if I had to select S1 then instead of selecting S1 I would as well select S4 because it is good in both, both the objectives right. So, this is an example which helps you to establish that uh, the nature of the function is to be studied before declaring them to be conflicting or not. So, for example, let us have this function that f1 is x cube, f2 is x square and we want to uh, maximize both this function right. So, if the feasible region is let us say the domain of x is between 0 and infinity right, then these two variable, then these two functions are non-conflicting right. I can ignore one of the objective function and just solve with respect to the other objective function whatever is the optimal solution I get that would be the same for this one also. But if we change the domain of the variables from instead of instead of from 0 to infinity if we do it from minus infinity to 0 right then they become conflicting right. So, uh, one has to study the nature of the objective function uh, the constraint and uh, the domain of the decision variable to determine whether two objective functions are conflicting or not right. So, this is just to give you the difference between single objective and multi objective optimization. In this course we will be restricting ourselves to single objective optimization right. So, let us say we have this 4 cases right, uh, uh, we have these 2 objective functions f1 and f2. If both are to be minimized right, so your Pareto front would look something like this. So, this uh, highlighted part. Uh, is what is the Pareto front right. So, all the solutions uh, in the direction of 0 0 would form the Pareto front right. If your uh, objective function f1 is to be minimized and f2 is to be maximized right. So, then we are looking at solutions which are pointing in the direction of uh, 0 comma infinity. Right? Uh, so, here as you can see the Pareto front here it was continuous here it can be discrete right. So, these points are actually inferior points you can work out just like you can randomly select one point over here and compare you will see that these highlighted points actually dominate uh, the, the, the other points right. Uh, so, if you have a max min then we are looking at uh, so, this has to be f1. Right. Then we are looking at infinity comma 0 right points. Uh, so, this direction is the Pareto front. So, if the both the objectives are to be maximized right then we are looking at uh, the points which are towards uh, infinity comma infinity right. Just like we had realizations in single objective optimization we can have realization in multiple objective optimization right. So, let us consider two solutions x1 and x2 and there are some let us say there is some uh, function f1 and f2 uh, uh, which is a relation of x1, x2, x3 
and this is also a relation of x1, x2, x3, right. So, here if we see if these two solutions are different, right. Here it means x1 is 5, x2 is 2, x3 is 1, right. So, over here it indicates x1 is 4, x2 is 3 and x3 is 5, right. So, in this case what happen, uh, in this case it can still happen depending upon what the objective function which we have, both f1 and f2 values are same, right. So, this is called as realization, these are not trade off solutions, the objective function is exactly identical both in x1 and x2, right. So, these are not trade off solutions, but these are realizations in multi objective optimization. So, just like we had realizations in single objective optimization, we can have realization in multi, uh, multi objective optimization, right. So, here two points correspond to the same value in the uh, objective function space. So, this is f1 comma f2, right. Now, let us come back to single objective optimization. First, we will see how to find out the optima for a single variable problem, right. There is only one decision variable whose value is to be found, right. Again, we are not considering the case wherein the constraints are there. So, we have an unconstrained optimization problem and single variable problem, right. So, in that case, the maxima or minima is located at the stationary point. So, stationary point you would have uh, come across in your uh, higher secondary education, right. So, those can be determined by equating the gradient of the function to 0. So, if it is a single variable problem, uh, if you have a function f of x, right, and if you want to find out the stationary point of this, then equate, uh, equate the derivative to 0. So, that will give the stationary point. Right. Stationary point only tells that either a minima or maxima occurs at that point. You will have to uh, uh, check the condition of the second derivative, right. So, the second derivative has to be evaluated at this stationary point. So, if the second derivative is positive, uh, then it is a minimum. If the second derivative is negative, then it is a maximum, right. If the second derivative is 0, then it is a saddle point. So, in, in for single variable we need to look at uh, higher derivatives to decide. So, in terms of multivariable problem, uh, we will have what is this Jacobian. Uh, so, the Jacobian has to be equated to 0. So, we will solve a multivariable problem. So, you would better understand. Uh, and the second derivative is nothing but Hessian matrix. Again, we will show you that. So, if the Hessian matrix is positive definite, then it indicates that the stationary point is minimum. If the Hessian is negative definite, then uh, it indicates that uh, the stationary point is maximum. And if it is indefinite, then again it is a saddle point. So, it is not possible to decide whether uh, at that point the function has a minimum value or a maximum value. So, let us consider this single variable problem f of x is equal to x cube plus 3 x square minus 6 x. Right. So, if you take the gradient of this that works out to be 3 x square plus 6 x minus 6, right. So, we will have two stationary points. So, now this has to be equated to 0. So, this is a quadratic equation. So, if we get, if we solve it, we will get two, two, two stationary points, right. So, the solution of the equation a x square plus b x plus c equal to 0 is x is equal to minus b plus or minus root of b square minus 4 a c by 2 a. So, if we apply this then we will get these two values, right. So, x is equal to 0.73 is a, 0.732 is a stationary point, x is equal to minus 2.732 is a stationary point, right. So, these are stationary points. So, at, with this information, it is not possible to say whether the function is minima or maxima, right. So, we need to find out the second derivative, right. So, second derivative for this is 6x plus 6, right. Now, the second derivative has to be evaluated at each of the stationary point 0.732 and minus 2.732, right. So, if we, uh, if we evaluate uh, the second derivative for 0.732 will turn out to be 10.392, 10 right. Since it is positive, it is a minimum, right. Whereas, the second point minus 2.732, since it is negative, it turns out uh, it will be a maxima. So, we have a minima at 0.732 and we have a maxima at minus 2.732, right. So, this plot shows uh, the variation of x with respect to f of x, right. So, if we vary x from minus phi to phi, uh, this is how the function would look like. And here if we see this value is 0 0.732, where you can see it is actually a minima. And here it will be the, the function will have a maxima, which is minus 2.732. So, let us look into a multivariable function, a multivariable function. Right. So, here f of x 
right is uh, involves uh, x1 as well as x2 as well as x3. So, we have three decision variables. So, uh, the Jacobian is nothing but the partial derivative of f re with respect to x1, partial derivative of f with respect to x2 and the partial derivative of f with respect to x3. Since we have three variables, if you have n variables, uh, all the partial derivatives are to be found. Right. So, here we, these are the three equations. Right. So, if you differentiate it, you would get uh, these three equations. So, this is our Jacobian now. Right. So, this has to be equated to 0. So, this if we see it is simultaneous linear equation. Right. So, this can be written as uh, 6x1 minus 2x2 mi minus 2x3 is equal to 6. Right. So, this equation can be written as 6x1 minus 2x2 minus 2x3 is equal to 6 and the rest of the two equation also can be written and if we see it will be uh, in the form of linear equation which can be said ax equal to b. Right? So, if we solve this uh, we will get the values, uh, we will get the stationary point. So, in this case it happens to be 2, 1 and 2. Right? So, this is a stationary point again with this we cannot say whether it is a minima or maxima. right? So, we need to determine the second derivative or the Hessian in this case. So, the Hessian is given by dou x square f by dou x1 square, dou square f by dou x1 dou x2 uh, all the way up to dou square f by dou x1 dou x uh, dou x1 xn. Similarly, we have dou x square f dou x2 x1, dou x square f dou x2 square and uh, so on. right? So, in this case for the three variable problem, uh, we will have to determine these partial derivatives. So, this is, uh, so here we have dou f by dou x1, dou f by dou x2 and dou f by dou x3. Right? So, if we do dou x square f by dou x1 square, so this equation if we further differentiate with respect to x1, we will get only 6. Right? So, dou x, uh, dou square f by dou x1 dou x2. So, this equation if we differentiate with respect to x2, we will get minus 2. Right? Similarly, this one, so dou x2 by dou x3. So, dou x2 is this equation, right? so we will get only plus 2. Right? So, if we plug that, we will get this is our Hessian matrix. Right? So, now we will have to see whether it is positive definite or negative definite. So, positive definite uh, if the principal determinant, so this determinant uh, this determinant and the first 3 cross 3 determinant, if all of this happen to be greater than 0, then it is a positive definite matrix. So, in this case it happens uh, that this is 6, right? so 6 into 4 minus 2, 2 into uh, minus 2 into minus 2, right? so that would work out to be 20. In this case, the all these 3 principal determinants happen to be greater than 0. Right? So, that is why uh, we can declare this point to be a uh, we can declare Hessian to be positive definite right? and the stationary point which we found is actually corresponding to a uh, minima. So, again uh, this example we will give it to you, uh, you can solve it. Right? So, in this case uh, we have a two variable problem x1 and x2. Right? So, if we do dou f by dou x1, dou f by dou x2 that is our Jacobian if we equate it to 0. Right. So, these two equations uh, can be satisfied by these three points. These three are our stationary points. Right. So, for these three stationary points, we need to find out whether the Hessian is uh, positive definite or negative definite. Right. So, Hessian again is dou square f by dou x1 square, dou square f by dou x2 square, dou square f by dou x1 dou x2, dou square f by dou x2 dou x1. So, we will need this one and you can again compose uh, the Hessian as shown over here. Right. So, if you compose the Hessian, uh, you will get something similar to, you will get this uh, matrix right? and then if you find out the eigenvalues of this uh, matrix. In the previous slide, in the previous problem, we only, uh, we saw uh, the principal, we saw that the principal determinants have to be positive right? for a Hessian matrix to be positive definite or we can use the eigenvalue properties that if the eigenvalues of a matrix is uh, positive, right? If all the eigenvalues of a matrix is positive, then the matrix is positive definite. If all the eigenvalues are negative, then the matrix is negative definite. If some of the eigenvalues are positive and some of the values are negative, eigenvalues are negative, then the matrix is said to be uh, indefinite.
right. So, in this case if you work out, uh, if you find out the eigenvalues or even if you calculate the determinant of this matrix, you will see that uh, you will get it, you will get a positive which corresponds, which tells that this is a minima, this particular stationary point is a minima. So, for the second point again if we plug in this x1, x2 values into this hessian matrix, right, uh, if you calculate the eigenvalues, right, you will see that uh, all the, both the eigenvalues are positive. So, again this hessian is a positive definite. So, this point corresponds to a minima, right, whereas the third point uh, here if we calculate again plug this x1 and x2 into this hessian matrix and if we calculate the eigenvalues. It, uh, one of the eigenvalue is negative and the other is positive. So, this is indefinite. So, here it is a saddle point. So, with this information whatever we have, we cannot say whether this is a minima or a maxima. So, we will be using this concept uh, while we are looking into regression, right. So, the first derivative has to be equated to 0, we will get stationary point. At that stationary point, we need to evaluate the second derivative, right. Uh, if the second derivative is greater than 0 for a single variable problem, it corresponds to a minima. If the second derivative is less than 0, it corresponds to a maxima for a single variable problem. For a multivariable problem, we need to uh, equate the Jacobian to 0, we will get the stationary point and we need to evaluate the Hessian matrix, right. So, for the Hessian matrix, uh, if it is positive definite, then the corresponding stationary point is minima. If it is negative definite, the corresponding uh, stationary point is maxima. So, now let us look into the advantages and disadvantages of uh, mathematical programming techniques. So, the advantages of mathematical programming technique is that it has a guaranteed optimal solution for well structured problems. So, if the problem is either linear programming, mixed integer linear programming or quadratic programming, there are algorithms uh, which guarantee that the solution that we will obtain at the end of the procedure will be globally optimum. Right. So, again here uh, in optimization you need to remember we have two things, one is that we want the best solution that exists in the search space and the second thing is we want to reach that solution as quickly as possible, right. Given a search space obviously you can uh, evaluate the objective function at each and every, every point and see at which point it is minima or maxima, but then in a search space there can be infinite points, right. So, that is why we do not do an exhaustive search, we rely on optimization techniques. Right. So, for these two category of problem, uh, these three category of problems, uh, there are algorithms, right, which guarantee the optimality of solution, right. And mathematical programming techniques are usual, uh, are helpful in de-bottlenecking, right. So, as in like it can provide reasonable insight into the solution as to what is stopping us from having a better solution uh, that can be uh, inferred from uh, for some problems. Uh, using mathematical programming techniques, right. It does not require multiple runs, uh, which is the case in meta heuristic techniques, right. The same technique this for the same problem will have to be run multiple times because it involves stochasticity, right. So, that is not the case in mathematical programming techniques. Um, again, it requires lower computational resources for certain classes of problems and there are no parameters that are to be uh, set by trial and error, right. So, which is the case in uh, meta heuristic techniques, right. So, those are the advantages of mathematical programming techniques. The drawbacks include that it has a rigid modeling framework, right. So, all the constraints have to be expressed in this form. For example, in Sudoku problem, the constraint that we have is that let us say if we denote a cell by x11 and its neighboring cell as x12, then the constraint that we have is actually x11 is not, should not be equal to x12, right. But that constraint is not of this form, that is like this, right. So, x not equal to y, if we have a problem wherein we have this constraint that x should not be equal to y, that has to be transformed into these such constraints, less than equal to or equal to, only then mathematical programming techniques can be uh, used, right. So, that is a drawback of uh, mathematical programming techniques, right. So, they are not naturally amenable to multi-objective optimization problems. Uh, so, if we want to solve a multi-objective optimization problem using mathematical programming technique, then the same problem has to be solved multiple times, right. And if it is a combinatorial problem, as in like if we have lot of integer variables, uh, as the size of the problem increases, right, the computational time increases exponentially, right. So, it can become computationally intensive, particularly for combinatorial problem. Uh, 
usually these techniques are designed to provide one solution, right? Some of these drawbacks have been overcome uh, in the softwares, uh, like uh, in the software, but in general these are the drawbacks of mathematical programming techniques. Let us now briefly look into uh, the four categories of problem, right? So linear programming, in linear programming problem, as we discussed the objective function is linear and, and the variables are continuous. So for linear programming problems, it is guaranteed that the optima always occurs at the vertex, right? And uh, linear programming problems uh, using the simplex and interior point method can be solved to global optimality, right? So that is an advantage of linear programming problem. So uh, this is a linear programming problem that uh, we have, right? So minimize z is equal to 4x1 minus x2. So our decision variables are x1 and x2. The constraint is that x1 and x2, 2x1 plus x2 should be less than equal to 8, right? So again we draw this line 2x1 plus x2 is equal to 8. So we will get this line. Uh, then we can, uh, another constraint that we have is x2 less than equal to 5. So that leads to this particular line. Uh, x2 less than x2 equal to 5. So when we say x2 less than 5, any value below this is the feasible region, right? So 2x1 plus x2 less than 8 is any value less than, uh, I mean in this region is actually a feasible solution with respect to this constraint, right? But with respect to this constraint, some of the feasible region is lost. Then we have this constraint x1 minus x2 is less than equal to 4. So again we will draw the line x1 minus x2 equal to 4. So we get this line, right? Uh, and then we have these variables that x1 should, and we have the bound constraint that x1 should be greater than equal to 0, x2 should be greater than equal to 0, right? So these lines we obtain, right? So this x1 is equal to 0, so it, the region above it and x2 x2 greater than 0 right so this this region right so if we look at all the constraints so this shaded region is actually the feasible region right so for linear programming uh, it can be theor it has been theoretically established that the optima always occurs at the vertex so the optima is either here 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 or here of this four points so there is no point searching at the interior points only these four points uh, have the optimal, one of these four points have the optimal solution. This is our objective function line 4x minus x2. So if we equate 4x minus 4x1 minus x2 as let us say minus 5, some value minus 5, then this is that line. So throughout this line, the objective function value is minus 5. Throughout this particular line, the objective function value is 0, right? So these are known as isocost lines, right? So throughout this line, Z1, Z is minus 5, right? So that is an ISO cost line. Uh, throughout this particular line, uh, Z is equal to 0. In this case, the optima occurs at this particular point, right? So the other four points, if you want, you can evaluate. Uh, you will see that uh, the, for the other four points, the objective function value will work out to be 0 for this one, 16 for this one, uh, again 1 for this point, for this uh, vertex, and minus 5. Right. So since our objective function is to minimize, uh, this vertex has the uh, best possible value for uh, the objective function. Coming to integer linear programming, so in integer linear programming, the decision variables are uh, scalars and integers, like we can have multiple decision variable, but all of them are scalars, right? But all of them are scalars. So the objective function and constraints are supposed to be linear over here. So here we have a linear programming problem, right? So we want to minimize this function 3x1 plus 2x2, that is our objective function, right? And the constraints are 4x1 plus 2x2 should be greater than or equal to 5, 2x2 is less than or equal to 5, x1 minus x2 should be less than or equal to 2. Again, we convert all these constraints into equality and we can plot all these lines, right? So this is the uh, uh, feasible region, right? But because of this constraint that x1 comma x2 belongs to integer variables, not real variables, so not all values of x1 and x2 are acceptable, only the integer values of x1 and x2 are acceptable. So that's why we have, uh, so because of that, uh, the feasible points are only these six, right? Because other points do not have integer values of x1 or x2, so only these values uh, are permissible values, right? So it might seem that uh, the search space is smaller uh, in case of integer variables, 
but uh, integer programs uh, integer programming problems are difficult to solve because we do not have the property of continuity of the decision uh, variables so uh, most integer linear programming problems uh, can be solved to global optimality given sufficient time right uh, but there are problems whose size is if the number of decision variables is too large then it is difficult to solve in reasonable time right but theoretically given sufficient time these uh, integer linear programming problems can be solved to global optimality so the common algorithms which are used for uh, integer linear programming are branch and bound and cutting planes so this is an example for mixed integer linear programming problems right in the previous slide we saw that all the variables were integer over here uh, the objective function and constraints are linear at least one decision variable should be integer right and at least one decision variable should be continuous that is why we have this uh, mixed right so these are the constraints this is an example right so in this case all the three variables are greater than or equal to 0 but x3 can take only integer value so x1 and x2 can take real values but x3 is an integer value so this is an example of mixed integer linear programming problem again mixed integer linear programming problem can be solved to global optimality given sufficient amount of time uh, so mixed integer linear programming problems are solved as a series of lp problems and the algorithms that we commonly use are branch and bound and cutting planes so nonlinear programming problems in nonlinear programming problems uh, either the objective function or at least one of the constraints or both are nonlinear right so the algorithms which are commonly used for solving nonlinear programming are for nonlinear programming are successive linear programming quadratic programming successive quadratic programming or generalized reduced gradient method right there are many other algorithms we have just listed a few of them over here right so here we have an objective function minimize f of x we have uh, m1 constraints m1 inequality constraints so j is equal to 1 j is equal to 2 j is equal to 3 it can go all the way up to m1 right and we have uh, m2 equality constraints right so uh, we can have constraints which say 3x1 square plus x2 is equal to 5, uh, 3x3 plus uh, x4 uh, is equal to 5. So, this is a nonlinear constraint, this is a linear constraint, right? So, again, uh, inequalities are allowed, equalities are allowed in nonlinear programming problem. This is an example of uh, nonlinear programming problem. In fact, this is a quadratic programming problem, right? So, we have we want to maximize x1 x2 subject to the constraint that 2x1 plus 2x2 is less than equal to 16 right so this is a linear constraint the objective function is quadratic right and x1 and x2 should be uh, greater than or equal to 0 so we can again draw this line so any line uh, any region below this is the feasible region so this shaded part is the region so these three lines show the value of the objective function right so but for this line since the problem is to maximize even though z is equal to 35 is a better value than z is equal to 16 it is not in the feasible region right whereas this z is equal to 16 is in the feasible region it touches this this point right so that is the optimal solution in this case right so again here we are not looking into uh, how we are solving, how we are going to solve a nonlinear programming, right? Here we are just introducing it you to what is a nonlinear programming problem. So, in a nonlinear programming problem, uh, global optimality is guaranteed only if the problem is convex or it has some special properties, right? So, in a mixed integer nonlinear programming, either the objective function or at least one of the constraint is nonlinear. Similar to mixed integer linear programming, there is either one, at least one uh, continuous variable and one at least one discrete variable. So this is an example of an MINLP, right? So it involves two variables, x1 and x2, uh, that both x1 and x2 uh, lie in the region 0 to 10, but x2 is also an uh, integer, right? So continuous values for x2 is not uh, allowed. So mixed integer linear programming problems can are usually solved as a series of NLP. Right. For an arbitrary mixed integer linear programming, there are no algorithms which can give guarantee that the solution which has been found is globally optimal solution. So that is why in my, uh, uh, some of the algorithms which are used to solve mixed integer linear programming are outer approximation and branch and bound.
uh, so the other class of techniques is meta heuristic techniques right so most of these techniques are uh, nature inspired they do not require any information about the physics of the problem so it's more like a black box communication right so in this case the problem need not be posed in uh, the conventional equality or inequality form which was a drawback in the mathematical programming techniques right here we don't have that requirement right so it is suitable to solve problems uh, which are multimodal uh, they have a large number of decision variable and continuous a uh, uh, large number of decision variable or constraints and some of the functions involved in the uh, problem are discontinuous so it does not give guarantee on the optimality of the solution but usually it gives a satisfactory uh, solution especially for problems which are difficult to be solved by uh, conventional method over here we by conventional method we mean the mathematical programming techniques and it can also be used to solve black box uh, optimization uh, problems right so in black box optimization problem you do not have a mathematical formulation uh, but given a solution you have some kind of mechanism uh, wherein the quality of the solution can be determined right so those are black box optimization problems so for black box optimization problem it is not possible to use mathematical programming techniques uh, most of the times we rely on uh, meta heuristic techniques right so this is uh, goldberg's view so goldberg was one of the pioneer uh, who worked in uh, 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 meta heuristic techniques right so these are the various types of problem uh, unimodal problem multimodal so we have seen what is unimodal problem multimodal problem combinatorial problems are those which involve large number of uh, integer variables right so this is problem type on the uh, x axis over here we have efficiency of the technique right so if we employ some random scheme right it is going to perform poorly right so this is not a very high efficiency it is going to perform very poorly uh, on all the problems right whereas if we used specialized schemes so for example linear programming simplex method that is a specialized scheme so it is going to work extremely well for unimodal problems or that particular class of uh, problems right but over uh, but otherwise it is going to have a uh, very poor performance in fact performance Uh, poor than any random random scheme so by random scheme we mean you give a, you give an optimization problem we let's say we randomly decide that uh, these are the values of x1 x2 and x3 the decision variables and it happens to satisfy the constraints right so that is a random scheme right uh, whereas this meta heuristic techniques are known as robust scheme right so it does not have a very high efficiency Uh, similar to specialized scheme uh, let's say for unimodal problems but across a wide range of problems it can be used right so that is the advantage of meta heuristic techniques it does not give guarantee uh, even if for special category of problem but overall it gives a satisfactory performance for most of the optimization problems right so uh, our objective in this course is to have uh, a knowledge of uh, meta heuristic techniques as well as some of the specialized scheme right so if we have a problem which actually falls into let's say linear programming or mixed integer linear programming we would not choose meta heuristic techniques if we are aware of uh, the specialized schemes right when a meta heuristic technique is designed it is usually tested on what is called as benchmark functions right so for this benchmark functions the optima is already known so given any procedure if we want to say whether the scheme is working or not right so what we will do is we will test it on this uh, benchmark functions right so since the optima is already known for the benchmark functions if the scheme is able to find the optimal solutions then the scheme uh, or the technique is said to be a reasonably good technique right so some of the benchmark functions that we will be referring in this course is uh, listed over here so spear function so spear function the objective function is uh, f is equal to x1 square plus x2 square let us say for a two variable problem x1 and x2 so this is how the objective function will behave in the search space uh, between minus 10 and 10 uh, right for uh, x1 and x2 so this is the objective function right so these are called as scalable function so i can also have x3 square x1 square plus x2 plus x3 square this figure is then no longer valid but in comp uh, but the objective function for spear function is written like this so these are called as scalable function uh, we can make this objective function for two variable problem three variable problem 100 variable problem 1000 variable problem 
right. So, that is what this d. So, this d determines the number of decision variable. So, that has to be fixed by uh, the user, right. So, by fixing the d, we can test meta heuristic techniques whether they are able to determine the optimal solution or not, right. So, this is another function Rosenberg function, right. So, the objective function here is as given over here, right. So, here if we have a let us say two variable problem, so the objective function is 100 x 2 minus x 1 the whole square plus x 1 minus 1 the whole square, right. So, this summation does not come into picture if we have two variable, but if we had three variable then it will be this, right, plus 100 x 3 minus x 2 the whole square plus x 3 minus 1 the whole square, x 2 minus 1 the whole square and so on. So, again by changing this d, we can actually uh, have uh, objective function of multiple variables, right. So, this is, so, so here if you go into this link, you will be able to see all these functions, right and MATLAB codes for all these functions are available. So, if you want to test a particular technique as we will do in the later half, later part of the course, uh, we can uh, use these functions to test uh, the efficiency of a particular technique. So, these are some of the other uh, commonly used benchmark functions, right. So, this shows the contour plots, right. So, rash engine function uh, you can have a look at its objective function uh, given in the previous slide. So, x 1 and x 2 this is how the search space looks like. Remember the contour plots are lines of objective function which have the same objective function value. Right. So, similarly over here for this function if you see uh, all the points in this particular on this particular curve have a similar objective function, right. So, the our task is to find out uh, the best value of x 1 and x 2 in this region. So, as you can see sometimes this region uh, can be really complex, right. So, uh, a random scheme would not be able to find out the optimal solution in this complex uh, regions, right. So, the meta heuristic techniques that we will discuss as part of this course uh, would be able to find out the globally optimal solution even with this complex functions. These are some of the functions. So, over here if we see this is the name of the function, uh, the actual function is given, d denotes the how many dimension, this is the range of the problem. So, if we have let us say 3 variable x 1, x 2, x 3, what is their domain? So, the domain here is minus 100 to 100 for all the 3 variables. So, again in the later half of the course we will test uh, uh, the optimization techniques that we study on, on these problems. So, for most of this problem if you see the optima is actually 0, the objective function value is 0 except in uh, few cases. So, these are the benchmark functions, right. So, very often uh, the techniques are also tested on engineering problems, uh, right. So, uh, right now, we just want you to be aware that these problems exist, right, as and when required in the course, we will be using them, right. So, these are some of the constraint uh, problems, right. So, for welded uh, beam, these are the equations. So, these are already available. So, the task for the technique is to find out the optimal value such that uh, whatever that function is either minimum or maximum. For meta heuristic techniques there are standard uh, conference, uh, there are prestigious conferences. So, for example, CEC, GECO all these are names of special, uh, all these are names of uh, reputed conferences. So, every year uh, when these conferences are conducted they have competition. So, they give out problems, uh, not the benchmark functions which you saw previously. Uh, there are some drawbacks with the benchmark functions which you have seen previously, we will discuss it later, right. But uh, these every year uh, as part of these conferences, these uh, benchmark functions are given to the user. So, a user is supposed to design techniques uh, and demonstrate its performance on these problems. These are available for most of the programming languages like uh, C, MATLAB, uh, the functions are already available. You, uh, you do not need to code the objective function as such, uh, you just need to evaluate uh, whatever technique you have proposed on these functions. So, this is some of the recent literature, right. So, meta heuristic uh, techniques are uh, a hot area of research, right. So, all these are papers which are published in 2019-20, right. So, all this is 2020. So, this is again a new algorithm, new meta heuristic algorithm, so bio inspired, 
right? Uh, the name of the algorithm is Manta Ray Forging Optimization. This is social mimic optimization algorithm. This is Kuril search algorithm. Uh, this is based on uh, Kuril search algorithm, right? And then there are uh, uh, algorithms which are modified uh, often, right? So, for example, BAT algorithm already exists. So, this paper proposes a hybridizing. Uh, BAT algorithm with differential evolution. So, we will be looking into differential evolution as part of this course, right. So, we will be looking into teaching learning based optimization, right. So, over here in this work, uh, they have uh, hybridized it with a neural network for engineering design of uh, optimization problem. Um, these are couple of examples for newly proposed multi objective optimization. So, for example, here if you see it is a multi objective artificial sheep algorithm. So, this algorithm has been probably designed based on the behavior of uh, sheep, right. Uh, here again we have multi objective firefly algorithm. So, you might know about fireflies, right. So, depending upon their behavior, this multi objective algorithm has been designed. So, the point that I am trying to reinforce is once you learn this 4 or 5, uh, uh, once we learn few of the meta heuristic techniques, you will be in a position to actually understand many of these papers. Right, and critically critically review uh, this work, and also and also possibly propose your own algorithm. So these are some of the classical uh, optimization books, right? So this uh, book particularly uh, helps in developing models, right? So we'll be touching upon developing models in this course, uh, but greater details are available in this book, model building it for mathematical programming. Uh, this is a classical book by Taha, Operation Research. Uh, this is again a standard textbook for engineering optimization by S. S. Rao. Uh, this one is by uh, Reclatis and co-workers, right. So, this is Goldberg's book on uh, genetic algorithm, uh, differential evolution uh, by Price and Stone, right. And this is another classical uh, book by Kalyan Maidev, right and we also have this uh, optimization of chemical processes. So, uh, since this course has also been listed under uh, chemical engineering, uh, those of you who are chemical engineers can actually look into this book wherein you have examples from uh, chemical engineering. Again, uh, whatever we are going to discuss as part of this course uh, does not necessarily borrow any concepts from any particular engineering field, right. Whatever we are discussing is going to be very generic, you can apply it to your own area. With that, we will be concluding this session. In this session, we have seen components of optimization problem, classification of optimization problems as well as classification of optimization techniques. Then we looked into multi-objective optimization, right. In this course, we are not going to see how to solve a multi-objective optimization problem, but at least broadly you know the difference between single objective optimization and multi-objective optimization. We followed this up with how to solve a single and multivariable optimization problem in the absence of constraints, right. So, after that we looked into meta heuristic techniques, right. So, we just give you a, a brief introduction to meta heuristic techniques and the major portion of this course is going to be on uh, meta heuristic techniques, right. So, the next session is going to be on uh, linear regression, right. So, the linear regression we have divided into three sessions, right. So, first we will be looking at uh, linear regression, simple linear reg regression. Then we will be extending that to solve polynomial regression problem and multilinear regression problem and we will also look into general linear least squares, right. So, the final session would be on how to use the inbuilt function of MATLAB to solve linear and nonlinear regression problem. So, for those of you who are not interested in learning MATLAB, you can skip that particular session, right. So, the quiz and assignment will not have anything from that particular uh, implementation session, right. So, with that we conclude this session. Thank you.